This is BBC One Scotland. Now for Insomniac Film Buffs Everywhere, Film 87. <laughs> Protocol starring Michael Caine. And Warzone with Christopher Walken as a journalist in Beirut. And there's an interview with Sylvester Stallone. Messrs. Gorbachev and Reagan may coup at each other over the question of nuclear disarmament. The Cold War will end only over the Fourth Protocol's dead body. For this, the screen version of Frederick Forsyth's novel is positively awash with blackguardly Russians plotting unspeakable things on British soil. For a start, there's the Soviet's top agent, Pierce Brosnan, licensed to kill and to frown menacingly at all and sundry, who's been installed next door to an American airbase in East Anglia, there to construct and ultimately to detonate a massive nuclear device. Good Lord, what is he up to? And more to the point, can anybody stop him? Well, to answer the second question first, enter Michael Caine, Britain's top agent, also licensed to kill, though not, as he discovers to his cost, to backchat his superior officers. Demoted for being cheeky to Julian Glover, Mr Caine finds himself struggling almost single-handedly to foil the evil Russian plot. The story behind the story concerns a power struggle between competing KGB generals, a hardliner, Alan North, who's covertly sent Mr Brosnan to England, and a pair of ambitious softliners, Ned Beatty and Ray McAnally. Ranged against them, and if you ask me grossly overmatched, is the acting head of the British Secret Service, obtuse Mr Glover, who refuses to listen to a word Mr Kane says. I regard this support as alarmist, irresponsible, and supported by insufficient evidence. Evidence? Can't you read? That metal disc can only be used as part of a trigger for an atom bomb. That remains to be seen. Don't think I don't know what's going on, Preston. You're trying to worm your way back into favour by dreaming up some far-fetched drama of which you yourself naturally are the hero. Yeah, and, and, and you're kicking out anybody who doesn't make themselves available to kick your ass. But if you were to look at this thing straight, just for a moment, you might see that there is something going on out there. It is my prerogative, as head of this country's security service... Acting head, sunshine. And if you ask me, you're acting like a complete asshole. is on. On the one hand, Mr. Brosnan using various couriers to smuggle his bomb into the country bit by bit, and on the other, Mr. Kane trying to find and stop him before he can explode the thing, thus discrediting the Americans who will get the blame, and very possibly destroying NATO and civilization as we know it. Just to explain the title, it seems that what Mr. Brosnan is contemplating would breach the Fourth Protocol, which as I understand it, is an international agreement that looks rather disapprovingly on one nation setting off nuclear devices on another nation's territory, and quite right too. In the resolution of all this, there is naturally a fair bit of action and general mayhem, and yet there's a quaintly old-fashioned look about the whole thing. I know a week is a long time in politics, and it could be that by the time you get around to seeing the film, the Cold War will be back in fashion. But I think you'll still be left with a strong feeling that you've seen it all before.
big surprise for the use of it. doesn't last long. It's not an unenjoyable film, it's just that, as adapted by Frederick Forsyth, who also co-produced, along with Mr. Kane, it all seems a little weary and predictable. The trouble with this kind of film is that characterization invariably takes third place to plot and action, so that while Michael Caine has some decent lines and business to grapple with, there simply isn't time for poor Mr. Brosnan to do lo a lot more than glower and go about looking shifty and suspicious. He must be sorrier than ever that he didn't quite land the James Bond role. On which note, let's move on to our regular look at the top ten films in London. At ten, The Golden Child, Eddie Murphy goes to Tibet to find a child with mystic powers. Nine is a room with a view. Maggie Smith and Denham Elliott are among this film's Oscar nominees. At eight, Gothic, Ken Russell's nightmarish vision of Lord Byron and Shelley and Friends. At number seven, we have The Mosquito Coast. Harrison Ford takes his family to the jungle to start a new life. At six, She's Gotta Have It low-budget hit which examines one girl's attitude to men. Five is The Name of the Rose with Sean Connery as the sleuth in a habit. Number four, Crocodile Dundee. At last, Paul Hogan has lost that top position. Three is Children of a Lesser God. William Hurt and Marley Matlin falling in love. Number two, The Fly. A man changes into an insect with gruesome results. But at number one, there's The Colour of Money. Paul Newman, Tom Cruise and The Game of Pool making up a very stylish film. Around the country, The Fly, Crocodile Dundee and The Golden Child are all doing very well. Now, The Warzone is a political thriller set in Beirut, which follows in the honourable tradition of films like Under Fire and Salvador. If it's not by any means as good as those two, it's still a very credible effort to show the horror and chaos of a country ripped apart by internal warfare. Christopher Walken plays an American TV reporter sent as a stand-in correspondent to cover the fighting in Lebanon. Howell Bennett, in a role that starts promisingly and then seems to have been cut down to little more than a cameo, is his cynical British counterpart. Mr. Walken, at first reluctant to set foot outside his hotel and risk getting his head blown off, is finally tempted out by the offer of an exclusive and startling interview with the leader of one of the warring factions. The man Mr. Stevens interviewed was a fake. What do you mean fake? How do you know that? You people came to me. Mr. Stevens, you seem better informed than we are as to what is going on in our organization. Mr. Salem, some of your leaders have recently given off the record views concerning changes in the Palestinian covenant, even possible recognition with Israel. I cannot comment on gossip spread by the Zionist press. I know the difference between news and gossip. My report was accurate. That's all there is to it. You know? Why do you hide the identity of the men then? <laughs> Tell us who it was. Come on. Oh, you're not lying. Right. Right. You know, we all know, I mean, we're talking about ethics. And if, if, if I don't protect him, he's dead, that's why. Of course he's right. That's the truth. Gentlemen, I think we can accept that Mr. Stevens was duped, and his denial shall be immediately forthcoming. Why would I do that? Absolutely not. Why would I do that? Mr. Salim, with respect, we all know it can only be one of four or five people. And my sources tell me that the gentleman... Mr. Stevens claims to have interviewed was Yassin Abu Riyad. Mr. Sir, can you confirm or deny the truth of this statement? Well, I think it will interest you to learn that Yassin Abu Riyad left Beirut two weeks ago. <laughs> so then now he's discovered that he's been set up for various political reasons and that the interview and the interviewee was an imposter, Mr. Walken begins to take a deeper interest. And it's at this point that the film becomes far too confusingly complicated for its own good. For Mr. Walken finds himself stumbling about in the midst of all manner of plots and counterplots, crosses and double crosses. And somewhere in the middle of all this is Marita Marshall as a nurse whose involvement goes a long way beyond administering Band-Aid and iodine. I suppose you could say that the film is accurate in that it's as bewildering as the situation in Beirut itself. But this, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily make for good drama. Nevertheless, Mr. Walken gives a strong and believable performance, and the scenes of carnage and despair are quite effectively captured. 
But now to Sylvester Stallone, he who has paid the tidy little sum of $12 million for starring in and helping to write Over the Top, the tale of a father's attempt to win back the love of his young son by impressing the lad with his arm wrestling skills. The film was produced by Cannon at a cost of $40 million and was directed by Cannon's joint boss, Menachem Golan. Tom Brook has been talking to Sylvester Stallone in Hollywood. It's a quite different part from what you've been playing more recently. It's very different from, say, Cobra, isn't oh, it, or, yeah. or Rambo? Right. Well, Cobra and Rambo are kind of like, um, they're overzealous civil servants, you might say. They really get down to the nitty-gritty of, of solving 